Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, webinar this afternoon. Thank you all very much for attending. I uh, do appreciate it's a very busy week for most of you, so it, your time is, is appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see the four of us who's on the call now. So, um, first of all, I'd just like to introduce Andy, my co-presenter from uh, Cavudo. Andy's um, going to be taking your questions, just feeding them through any technical queries. So, hopefully, we're not going to lose Andy. And then we've got really, really delighted to introduce Audrey and Mark, our two experts for this afternoon, and just appreciate their time so much. Um, Audrey, from a technical background, I'll let her introduce herself in a little bit later. She's the Director of um, Safety Food Matters, and Mark, uh, Director and Co-Owner of quite a few businesses, actually, and I'll let him explain in more detail those. But again, thank you both for your time today. So it's going to be a very Q&A session. I've obviously got some questions that I'm going to ask the guys, but on your left-hand side of the screen, you will be able to type your questions in, okay? So no question too silly or too big. Um, if you don't ask it, someone's probably thinking it already, but just please do ask these questions, um, you know, even if they're sector specific or something that comes up, just fire them away. If we can't answer them this afternoon, we will find an answer for you. Well, hopefully. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just show you a short video to introduce what Natasha's Law is, why it's coming around, and then we'll start the webinar. Um, we are going to keep our cameras and mics on during the session. We have muted everyone else, um, so no one can see you, no one can hear you, but you do have access to the Q&As, okay? Um, also, just before we start the video, I've got a poll that we're going to start here. Um, if you could all please do your vote to that, even now while the video is coming in. And I am going to show the video now. Just bear with me. Natasha's law is really important for British society. Um, and what it's about uh, is about food labelling on pre-packaged for direct sale food. Sounds a bit complicated, but it's not at all. This is all uh, relevant to food that is actually made on the premises of a particular uh, sandwich shop, for example, and then pre-packaged before it's sold to the public. So it's a pre-packaged food for direct sale. And Natasha's Law is all about covering uh, the labelling that relates to the ingredients of that food and also highlighting the 14 allergens uh, on that food as well. Natasha's Law means that all pre-packaged food, whether it's made in a factory or if it's made on site, will have to include all the ingredients so that anybody looking at the label on the packaging will know exactly what they're buying and therefore they can make a good decision as to whether or not that's safe for them. So currently uh, food producers who, who make food that are pre-packaged for direct sale on the premises don't actually have to adhere to any laws or regulations that, that uh, mean they have to put any ingredients on. And that, I think, to a lot of people would be quite a shock, as it, as it really was to us. I think it was unbelievable when we found that out. I think all our lives we believed that uh, what, whatever they needed to be said would be put on the packaging, as we see it when we buy food in a supermarket that is packaged. But it's not at all the case in sandwich shops around the country. In our family's case, Natasha bought a sandwich, or we bought a sandwich together actually at the airport, and it was pre-packaged, so it looked rather like a supermarket sandwich, and there was what I'd call partial information on it, so it gave some of the ingredients on the sandwich, but not all of it. So in many ways, we, we were kind of lulled into a sense of false security, and this is the big problem. When you're buying and you're moving on the go and you're buying food, you make decisions quickly. So you don't lull on it and just you know, think for hours on end about it. It's fast. And if there's information there, you read it and you take it at face value. And there's a trust element there. And in this case, that trust, well, that trust costs us our daughter's life. It's really important that Tasha's law comes into force and those things do change so that uh, people with allergies are properly protected, like they should be, and not second-class citizens. It's outrageous. 
This is covering a law that existed that was never really meant for large chains that prepackage food and it's really tightening it and making it safe so that ultimately it can save people's lives. Quite a powerful introduction there, I think, for you all. So I hope you appreciated that. Um, and you can get any more information that you want. Obviously, that was Natasha's parents. The Natasha Allergy Research Foundation um, is a really good, really good resource um, for what we're going to talk about. So I'm just going to publish the results of the poll. Thank you, that all that everyone that um, voted. So five people very confident. Hopefully, Mark and Audrey are two of those. Um, and then the rest of you, some quite confident, which is great, and then some not really sure. So hopefully by the end of the session, most people are very or quite confident. We've got a bit of work to do there. I'm sure we can get it done. So first of all, if I could um, hand over to Audrey, if you could just introduce um, yourself in terms of a, a business perspective, where you've worked before and the work that you do now, please, Audrey. Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you for inviting me onto the uh, webinar today. So um, I was uh, having a bit of a think about where my um, interest in, in allergens and allergies started. And um, I did a degree in food science and nutrition um, and went to work for Sainsbury's. Um, and that coincided with, with really the first um, event, if you like, um, or incident with people dying from anaphylaxis back in 1994. Um, because of my background, I actually began to work with the anaphylaxis campaign because it started then with uh, David Redding and his, his daughter who died. Um, and it's really carried on from there. So I've worked for retailers um, over the years um, in all sorts of different capacities, but always with, uh, you know, technical in the background. Um, and then more recently, in the last 10 years or so, I've um, been working as a consultant for Safer Food Scores um, with our main aim of helping, you know, um, people and businesses of all shapes and sizes and models to, to keep their compliance in line um, and to help them, you know, find solutions to all of the challenges that are being thrown at us. And this is obviously one that is uh, right at the forefront of a lot of people's minds at the minute. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we spoke yesterday, didn't we? And last week, I know you're so busy at the moment. I think that's going to carry on <laughs> for, the, for the foreseeable, for sure. But thank you very much for this afternoon. Mark, um, I can't even begin to explain your experience and your company, so I'm going to ask you to do that, please. Well, good afternoon, all, and thank you for inviting me again. And uh, so I own Niche, uh, which was first a restaurant. And in 2013, I was diagnosed with celiac disease. And then we changed the restaurant. My business partner said, there's no point owning a restaurant you can't eat in. So we became London's first 100% gluten-free accredited restaurant. It took about a good year to get uh, into that place. And uh, we were accredited by Celiac UK. We, um, I've worked, I, I was also working in the airline industry for some years um, as head of food for a company called Alpha LSG in the, in the UK and in some, some, some work in Germany. And obviously couldn't eat half the food there because it wasn't marked and saw a gap in the market to set up a business uh, around special meals. So that's what we did. So we have set up a niche free from kitchen, uh, which is a factory that produces um, was exclusively gluten, nut and peanut and sesame free. And then we do handle other allergies, but they're done within separate days and separate ways of working. And we've been working with Cafudo since our uh, inception. Uh, to, to use their software to create labeling and quantitative um, uh, food uh, ingredients for all our food. We set up uh, Libro, Libro, which is our airline um, travel brand, which um, provides um, special meals that you may order. There's about 23 different ones. We do the non-religious ones. And we also have a brand called Bear Food, which is our retail brand, which is, again, free from... Um, brand and cup food which is a top brand of that uh, for children uh, which we also serve into the airline industry and then we have another brand called newt which is for private well, predominantly private private healthcare although we are we are actually manufacturing on behalf of a company for the nhs who provide food 
uh, again, which is either allergen free or free from particular allergens or um, covering a particular dietetic strategy around um, diabetes or perhaps um, uh, low calorie, low fiber, all, all, all kinds of different uh, foods which are, are fairly specialist. And my interest is absolutely because I suffer with an allergy myself and um, I used to be apologetic for it. I'm no longer apologetic because I don't want to be sick. And <clears throat> this campaign, I'm absolutely behind because I believe people should know what they're cooking and should, should know the ingredients that they are using and be able, be, be able to do that. But it's not instinctively how chefs work, which we'll, I guess, come on to later. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. How well, many restaurants are accredited, do you know, in the UK? I, I'm, this is, there are different kinds of accreditation. We're accredited with Celiac UK. Mm -hmm. um, exclusively gluten-free, I couldn't tell you that there aren't that many. Mm -hmm. But many restaurants, even like uh, I think Pizza Express is an example, they, they have accreditation for the gluten-free bit that they right. do. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, you're only as good as every member of staff in your team, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, and using the right product, using the right ingredient and labelling it in the right way. Yeah. Training, training, training. Training, training. Thank you. OK, so let's ask some questions then. So, um, Audrey, if I ask you first, um, what should food businesses be doing right now then? So the law comes into effect October 1st. What should we be doing now? Um, well, I think the main thing is, is to prepare. You know, you've still got five months. Um, the law comes into force in October, but it, it doesn't mean you can't do anything prior to that. So you can start labelling in this way straight away if you wanted to. So, um, you know, I think um, we certainly experienced this previously with the 2014 changes with the um, allergen requirements that were then put, uh, put into place with caterers having to provide the information. And a lot of people did leave it right to the last minute. Um, I remember the phones ringing off the hook with people panicking the week before. Um, I feel like there's a lot more has been going on from an industry what for industry wise with this initiative. So hopefully, um, uh, you know, a lot of people will be a lot better prepared for it. So I think um, in terms of my my top tips, it can be a little bit daunting at this point because um, certainly from people who have been coming to us, they've been panicking and, and, and overwhelmed by potentially what they think it might be. Um, and I think um, whenever I speak to people, it's always about calming them down and saying, look, you know, this might not mean that everything that you produce has to be labelled. So I think establishing um, what needs to be labelled initially um, could prevent a lot of, you know, uh, anxiety and, and, and panic at the initial stages. So I think that's certainly something that, that business could, businesses should be doing now. Is establishing exactly what's going to be impacted by this directly. Yeah, you're right, Audrey, because a lot of a lot of businesses won't be affected. Um, you know, if yeah, it takes exactly. away yeah. and things, I think we can go into a bit more detail later who isn't and who isn't affected. But who would you say is the main sector? Is there one type of business sector within our food industry that is affected more than others, do you think? Well, I would think it from from my experience so far, it's probably people who are in that hybrid situation where they're they're retailing, but they're kind of catering at the same time. So you know, you know delis and sandwich shops, bakeries, uh, you know, butchers preparing meat pies and and things like and sausages and things like that. So where they've got the 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 retail element, but it is kind of touching on the catering side where they would have. You know it would have covered them previously mm -hmm. um, and i think you know that those are the ones who really are going to have to to get to grips with this and of course a lot of those are smaller businesses yep yeah it's really going to impact on the small and mark on your side i guess there's no change for your business am i correct in saying that? um not for the restaurant for the um labeling we've had to change for the airlines we had to change our labeling um oh, yeah. Completely. So it's uh, we have quantitative ingredient listings and that kind of thing on it, um, and that was fairly fairly straightforward for us um, because we already have the we, we work our recipes that way. So it comes from software. When you're multiplying a recipe by a thousand portions, you have to 
use software and uh, it takes the actual ingredients we're buying, which is what we do. Uh, but yeah, but, but you've been doing that already, just in a different format, I guess, now to take yeah. it to that next level up. Well, they're retail ready. The the, the yeah. program we have is retail ready, so that's what we yeah. use it for. We use it when we um, sell ready meals, principally, which is what we do. We, we also have um, things like snacks and sandwiches on board, albeit gluten free ones, um, which we um, m manufacture, and they have to be labelled in exactly the same way as as the meals. Now, I think it's I think it's actually really good practice, just generally. Yeah definitely is and it, it just makes it really clearer now doesn't it everyone knows everyone will know what they have to be doing and for the end user they know what to expect and they know they're going to get that commitment um audrey then so what kind of mistakes are you not mistakes that's probably a bit harsh but what concerns are customers coming to you your clients coming to you and asking about um i think that there is quite a lot of sort of panic and, and, and people um, wondering what on earth is going on. I've had quite a lot of people um, worrying or saying, you know, this is a ridiculous piece of legislation. Where did this come from? And, and you have to explain the consultation that went on with the food industry, which, was, you know, it did go on for a long time. And it was it was not just industry. It was trade bodies. It was consumers themselves. Um, so just trying to ensure that people understand where the actual legislation came from and, and the fact that it was consulted on with, you know, far and wide. And I think um, it's also worth pointing out, um, if people are, you know, thinking, well, this is ridiculous. Obviously, we've just seen the video with Natasha's parents and how awful that scenario was. But also the, the, the biggest part of the consultation was with people who are allergy sufferers and overwhelmingly, they wanted the full ingredients list. And there's two reasons for that. Obviously, it, it does quite clearly state then the different ingredients and what they might be in. But also, um, you know, people aren't just allergic to 14 ingredients. They just happen to be the most commonly allergic ingredients in, 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 the, in Europe. Um, so people who are allergic to tomatoes, for example, will now be able to look at a label on that sandwich and be able to see whether it contains tomatoes or not. It might not be in bold, but it is another source of information for them. So I think um, one of the, the areas that people have, they don't really understand where it's come from and how it's been, um, you know, got to this point, really. Um, one of the other things that, um, again, I just said about what, you know, confusion over what's actually covered by the legislation, um, you know, and, and also people who haven't quite got a grip on their supply chain or their recipes or their products or their sort of stock systems, they seem to be having a lot of problems or issues with understanding how on earth they're going to tackle this. Um, I, I remember in the, the last round with, in 2014, I remember talking to a big large hotel chain who were digging deep into their supply chain and found they have five supplies of maple syrup which, you know, just seems ridiculous, really, because it just wasn't a thing that was really controlled. It was done on a cost basis, so, you know, a supply deal that someone had done. Um, and now that, you know, they had to deal with that in terms of, the, the, you know, the throughput to the allergy information. So there's a few things that, that are kind of coming out in terms of um, systems and management of, of products and suppliers. Yeah, that's a good point. On one hand, it's going to hit the small retailer, who doesn't have things in place, but also the big guys might have different, their hotels might be different, you know, buying from different sources and they just didn't know. So it is, it, it is really a change that everyone needs to be aware of. And I think looking at your supply base is, is a really good idea. Well, it's paramount, isn't it? Um, one thing you picked up on the, it's not just the 14 allergens. That's interesting. We're actually doing um, a project with one of our education clients at the moment. Because as you say, it's not just the 14 and so many school children now, it could be a type of fruit or anything that's not just the 14. So we're looking at how we can provide total ingredient list to them, not just the 14 allergens that we can't do. So that we currently do. So that it's really interesting to feed that back and hear what you're doing, what the queries are coming in. Um, so, Mark, just on a Cthulhu question then. So, obviously, you've been, you, you and your team have been using the software for a while. I mean, could you have done it without software? 
Uh, um, it would be difficult. It's, it, certainly, in, certainly in the factory, in the restaurant, probably less difficult. But the problem is, it's not an instinctive way for a chef to work where they write an ingredient. Out. If, if I take a simple example, if we make a sandwich at home, we take the bread bread out of the bread bin, we take the butter out of the fridge and and you take your filling out. Do you look at the ingredients because you know what you have or you think you know what you have? And when we, but that's what is generally applied into the deli business or, or other businesses we can think of. And we just have to change that. We have to recipe everything and I have to say the, the biggest challenge for me was always getting chefs to write down their recipes, but actually actually taking those recipes from the ingredients they are actually using and can consistently buy. So if you if you having no substitutions, for example, if you've agreed a particular brand of, I don't know, mayonnaise or or something, you don't you cannot substitute that for another one because the allergens and ingredients may change. And that is not an instinctive way of thinking i think for lots of people and um you know i've worked with westminster um university um and it's not particularly um on their curriculum hopefully it will be now um and it's something that needs to be educated early on chefs tend to be creative and instinctive and all of those things and therefore actually jotting a piece of paper and sticking to that piece of paper and the days where you can, especially in food production, where you can um, just taste some things, oh God, that needs more salt, that needs more pepper, that needs more this, you can't do that. You have to stick to your recipe. And it, um, we produce uh, on behalf of uh, a company for the NHS. And as an example of that, they have no added salt in any of their food. And you get a chef coming, okay, well, I taste that. Oh, that's bland. That's so bland. I need to put some salt in. And of course, they can't do that because that's exactly what the client wants in this particular case. But it is an example of how um, chefs need to, chef, chef's thinking perhaps needs to change. And the things that they're selling in the, you know, the grab and go fridges and the delis and all those kind of places, they, you've, got to, you've got to look at every single ingredient that goes into them and make sure that um when you when the labeling is done everything has been transferred through in a quantitative way um or quid as, the, as it's called and um you can see what's in it and as audrey said there are many other allergies other than the 40 we at the restaurant have lots of people asking um for different things no pepper in this no uh capsicum all sorts of things and now um certainly uh in grab and go food they can they can see that and uh, I think that's a massive, massive um, benefit for people. And I, I hope, if I'm honest, that restaurants move to that for menus as well. Because I, I think often that as a gluten-free person, people don't understand what that is. Yeah, uh, I am glu I'm, I, I'm not gluten-free necessarily by choice. I am, I am because I have celiac disease and it's, uh, it's poison to me. So I don't uh, always trust that people have been well trained. Uh, people come up to me and say, "Oh, can you eat rice? Can you eat potatoes? Can you eat and and, and things we would think because we work in this industry uh, are fairly obvious, but they're not. They are not obvious and, and should never be assumed. So what we are, are doing by this is taking away assumption, and we're giving people the information to make their own their own decisions about what they put in their mouth. But we are only as accurate. As the information we put into the system that comes out so that that's there, there are some challenges around that and checking it from from a quality assurance point of view yeah no, that's great thank you and it's also things like it's the planning as audrey said earlier i mean that trip to tesco's now has an impact doesn't it you can't just nip out and get a substitute ingredient if you can you need a process in place to make sure that you have checked what's in that product what I'm going yeah, to do definitely. now, I think oh, sorry, what I was just going to say was um, I think it's becoming more and more of those conversations when you when you either set up a new business or take on new suppliers is, you know, you should be asking those questions. What will you do as a supplier? What will you do when you have to substitute something? Will you call me? Will you email me? Will you put a note on the delivery, you know, documentation? And if they can't give you a satisfactory answer as to how they're going to be dealing with that for you, then you know you, you then have to think about either whether you use them as a supplier or whether you just have a no substitutes policy as mark was talking about earlier 
Um, but having those conversations in early stages is really, really important. Yep, very much so. What I'm going to do now is uh, we're, we're getting some questions through, which is great. Thank you, everyone. I think we'll just go to a few questions. Um, so the first one is um, from Peter. Thank you. Currently, the onus is on the customer to ask regarding allergies. Do you think this will change with the new law? Uh, no, I don't think that will change at all. I think um, it is a bit of a joint onus because um, food businesses have to either show the information or signpost to it. So that's very directly, um, you know, that is a, a responsibility of the, of the food business operator to do that. Um, and then the customer uses that information and, and makes that decision based on their own personal circumstances. So I don't think it will change. Um, I think what will change is the type of information they're able to view to be able to then make those decisions. It's still the responsibility of the person, the allergic person themselves, to look after themselves. I think that, you know, that's still very... But is, do, Would you agree with that, Mark, as a, as a Celia? Is it, it's your responsibility? Um, ab absolutely. But it's also the responsibility of the food provider to give me accurate information. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, when you, when I when I go out, it is absolute trust in that business's ability to cater for me safely. And you know, you know, particularly early on in my diagnosis, when I when I first had to live entirely um, gluten free, I I made mistakes. I, I trusted restaurants I shouldn't have done, uh, even though they told me the thing was gluten free, there was contamination with it, and then as a consequence, I was unwell. And I do think it is um, the responsibility of the person with the allergy to absolutely check, but it must be a business's responsibility to be giving rele you know, relevant, accurate, timely information for which you, from which you can make a decision. I, I never go to a restaurant nowadays just off on the hoof. I will always yeah. have Explore. view online, have a look online. You know, you get you get a really good impression by information generally pe people or restaurants put online about their products about their you know grab and go there's not many places i would go for grab and go um to be honest because they, they they just don't have it marks and spencers maybe because that stuff's made in a factory but um mm -hmm. there are not many places where i would trust enough that they have a clean down process in between allergens or they um you know um the, Tasha LaBruce, the girl who died on the, uh, on the plane with the sesame allergy, her allergy was sesame. And um, she, she is sadly one of many, many people who have died over the years through these kind of um, allergies and labelling. So labelling is a fantastic thing to help sort some of those things out. But yeah. it, there is also the challenge of cross-contamination within businesses and many other factors that go towards making up um, uh, an allergen free meal and my biggest hope is that the phrase may contain disappears or dissipates yeah, because yeah, yeah. anything that may contain might contain so things like cross-contamination will become a bigger thing I think and and that's been quite an interesting one um, with um, the FSA um, they they decided to retain the voluntary nature of those um, of that sort of labelling, the precautionary labelling. Um, and, and the reason they gave was because, because of the new legislation with the actual label saying the, the deliberately added ingredient, you know, the, the one, the intentional allergen is on the label, um, that eliminates, you know, that potential risk at the start for it, mm -hmm. of it containing something that you're not expecting. Um, but then the precautionary statement then would take it to the next level. Um, and they decided to keep that, that voluntary. And it's a really difficult one as a, as a food operator because you want to, you know, some people will, will call it alibi labelling and say it's to cover my backside and say, OK, yeah, yeah, we can't guarantee that, you know. But on the other side, if I'm not an allergy sufferer, but I think if I was an allergy sufferer, I'd rather know that there was a risk of cross-contamination than not. I still think, I still feel like I'd rather know because then I can make that informed decision. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think when it's actually on an ingredient level, 
um, that's when suppliers have often been lazy. So yeah. for, a good example of that is when you buy herbs and spices, uh, which you may use in, you know, to flavor a mayonnaise or sandwiches in this kind of context, um, you often, those, those packages will say may contain which uh, means that whatever you put on your labelling must also say may contain um, as, a, as a result. But anything that may contain, if you have a, a, an anaphylaxis allergy, would stop you eating it anyway. And yeah. it is, um, I hope it will not be used as a get out of jail uh, mm -hmm. free card and people will do the work. Of course, there is a risk of cross contamination in any kitchen from, you know, if you're handling other, other, gluten containing ingredients for example or nuts or um sesame which is in you know omnipresent in lots of sources and 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 particularly um you know hummus and all sorts of things uh, that people don't necessarily think about and we just have to be more mindful i think and uh, make sure that um main listed allergen is there um and highlighted but if the i think suppliers are are beginning to do the work get send send product for testing so they can get they can eradicate those things i know we work with a large supplier which i'm sure many people here call breaks uh for products not not promoting them um and with bid food and they are all really 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 working hard to change their allergen um information on every single product on their websites um and um, they in fact do help us do an export to cafoodle to make that a little bit easier for us uh, so when we update prices and all that kind of thing that's all in there automatically uh, and it does the allergens as well which is fun which does make life a lot easier yeah yeah you know, i think it comes back to a lot of hygiene doesn't it at the end of the day you know clean, yeah. up, clean down what you've been making before before you start something new it does boil down to that but in busy environments as you said before chefs aren't always or you know sous chefs they're very busy people they're not always on it in that in that respect so it's awareness of that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That and just basic understanding of what those things are, I think, in some yeah. instances. So the more we educate, the better. It's funny actually, because both those things, we've got a couple of questions. One is about training and one is about suppliers. So I mean training, you know, all I see now is adverts for chefs coming back, chefs, chefs, chefs. We've got this we haven't got the European workforce that we had before. How are we going to train our people, Audrey? I'll ask you first. Um, well, there's actually um, there are actually some really good free resources that the FSA have produced. So there is a, a, an allergen um, course that's absolutely free. It's online. It's, you just have to register. It's dead easy to access. Um, it has been updated with all of the new PPGS um, requirements. So um, I, I would thoroughly recommend that people look that up. It probably, I can send you the link and we'll, we'll put that up somewhere. And yeah, we'll put that on our resources. That. That's great. Thank you. Um, there is also another one, that free one that the FSA done, which is about labelling in general, um, because this is this legislation kind of falls between food hygiene and trading standards. So it, it's it's a little bit unusual and that it straddles both disciplines. So um, if you are responsible for, for um, you know, devising this information, um in in whatever way you decide to do it um going on that kind of course actually gives you the basics of of what um of how to devise names how to devise ingredients lists descending order what that all means um and those are really good starting places and of course being free there shouldn't be any barrier really to people doing them. yeah thank you and i guess mark it just is everything's got to become second nature hasn't it it's yeah, I think, I think there's an instinctive change that's got to happen. And that, that goes right back to when you first start becoming a chef or cooking in that world. But training, absolutely refresher training, uh, just to keep it as a reminder for people that this is they should be conscious of this. Changing the way chefs work into recording and writing recipes and understanding that the ingredients they put in those recipes are the ingredients that they will put in those recipes time and memorial until they change that label or their recipe and that's just a new way of thinking and i think that only education is is, is going to do it and um i hope that working with um colleges and universities and and, and those kind of people they will sponsor that philosophy because even the older chefs within those environments are not used to this this is new this is a new yeah. thing yeah and uh 
um, you know, I, I'm guilty myself of many moons ago. I never did any of this stuff. I wasn't allergic to anything. It didn't. It wasn't in my consciousness, and it was only brought into my consciousness as much when I was diagnosed myself. And then our restaurant became a business that attracted people with allergies, and we wanted to become the friendly face of for people with that. It, you know, if people said to us, "We are following this diet or this diet," I want them to have a good time. I want their experience to be a good one and not as being the proverbial pain in the bottom uh, for lots of restaurants, which I think people with allergies, you know, can unfortunately be turned, you know, perceived as. And actually, they've got to eat. They they deserve to go out and have a good time just as anybody else. And if you give them the information, they can make their own decisions about what they have. And most people with allergies will look before they come to you anyway, I think. Yeah. Of course, of course. And we spoke about supply chain and Mark, you mentioned uh, the two big boys, Bids and Breakfood, who we, we work with very closely. And I have to say the data they send us is tip top these days. It really is. It's automated. It's coming in. There's changes. They delist if there's any change in allergy. Yes. Does that mean we can't work with smaller suppliers now? I mean, no, not at all. But you it is more challenging. I'll, I'll say that we do work with another one, which we've unfortunately had to drop because the it, the quality of allergen information they provided was just not good enough and they did that caveat thing where they put may contain on everything and it was just absolutely no good to us anything with may contain can't can't actually come through our threshold yeah. so um it just makes it a non-starter so we've had to we actually had to find a spice company for example because we couldn't buy many of them who hand bag the the items and it was the only one we were able to use um, we have a we have a quality assurance process within our business because obviously it's manufacturing, which is slightly different. But we had to do those checks and make sure that we we could find those ingredients, and uh, it's, it was it was a bit of a challenge. Um, a lot of as you say, there are if you do your homework, if you do your due diligence, then there are companies out there that yeah, have there are working practices and can yes. provide the right information. I mean, I mean, raw ingredients are raw ingredients at the end of the day. And if you cook from scratch, which, you know, I'm not sure everyone does, but lots of people do, uh, you're taking raw vegetables, raw meat, raw, and you're making them into something. It is sometimes the hidden things like canned foods, um, sauces in particular, um, spicing, where you really have to look more more consciously at the label, at the labelling uh, to see what other hidden ingredients are in there that you might not have thought. I think you'll be surprised at, oh, I didn't know that had that in it. And that happens a lot. Okay. Yeah. Also, it's okay. worth pointing out that um, if, if suppliers are saying to you, oh, well, I'm providing it to you loose, so I don't need to provide that information, that actually isn't, isn't actually correct. The law does state that even if you're supplying the bulk item for a caterer and it's in, in it's or a food business operator and it's not a packaged product itself you still have to provide the information that that customer needs to fulfill their obligations so you know that's when you're asking for technical specifications with ingredient breakdowns and, and things like that within them um they are they they do have to so there's going to be a learning you know all the way down the supply chain because they're going to be being asked for this information um in more detail yep thank you um we have quite a few clients in the care sector one of them has asked do, does this affect them in the care sector audrey i'll open that one up to you um certainly if you're pre-packing any items for provision to people within in your um in your in care homes and things like that um, because the, whilst the, whilst we're calling it pre-packed for direct sale, actual physical financial transaction doesn't have to take place. It also is food that's offered. So, you know, care homes, hospitals, things like that, perhaps at a school where, you know, somebody isn't actually giving you money. Um, it does still apply because you're providing that food to them in a, in a pre-packed format and it's direct to that person. So if they are pre-packing, then it would apply to them. Yeah, that's the key, isn't it? It's the pre-packing on site that's the criteria. And someone's asked about what could I ask this one to you, Mark? So a pizza restaurant, for example, what what could they do to be a perfect scenario? What do they need to do to go above and beyond? So I guess this is 
what you could explain a bit about what you do in your restaurant to make that difference um i mean it's, it's really knowing your supply chain and knowing your ingredients so make sure your recipes are those that you adhere to the the actual supply chain you have is is uh, you've checked that supply, supply chain and they are delivering what you order so that's also a, a challenge too so making sure the ingredients that that you you have bought from your supplier be that i guess uh tomato sauce or your mozzarella or whatever it is you're having for your pizza is just containing the ingredients you expect it to and i think one of the things that changes is on your goods in so when you have goods in uh, to your premises you are checking that those ingredients match what you have ordered you need to put in a double check which you may not have done before uh, that the ingredients that you've got on your recipes that you have ordered are the ones that are being delivered and not substituted as audrey uh, said earlier we have a no substitutions policy and i would urge people to adopt that you know unfortunately such and such a sandwich or such and such a dish will not be available that day because that product wasn't available i think that would be a safer um way of working than substituting or you know putting one item that's you know a particular flavor in a sandwich that you can't any longer because it wasn't available just drop it off the menu for that day or however long that product is unavailable. I think it's much safer way of working. In a pizza place, I think that they um, really need to make sure that the, it's very much about the ingredients and that the, um, I guess if you think about where a pizza place works, they have all the ingredients laid out, the chef just goes into one hand, one hand, one hand, grab, grab, grab. So perhaps moving to a method where they pre-portion those things in in um kind of vessels and then that's the portion so there's no actual hands going in it's actually the things so they're taking those ingredients and perhaps sectioning their their layout into allergens as well so they have um those allergens lots of salamis and things like that contain celery and there's other other allergens within them so they are really marking that up properly and not con and not cross con cross contaminating which is the biggest challenge for pizza restaurants as i understand it um i went to a really good talk with um uh, the lady from pizza express when she was talking about how they went through their accreditation for celiac uk and it was interesting they changed their flour completely uh, so the flour that they dust with is is a gluten-free flour so the biggest worry for a, somebody who's celiac going into a pizza place um, and there is a rather another large pizza chain where they don't do that and therefore I would not eat there as a consequence but they use normal flour to dust around so that flour is flying everywhere uh, and also making sure that if they're putting stuff in the same oven at least it's on on a cover or sorry on a base so that thing is being cooked um, at least with some protection so I think there's there's quite a few things that they could do yeah. and just really think about the groups of allergens that they have yep Brilliant, thank you. Um, Audrey, what what would you say to smaller businesses? They must be coming to you now and saying, this is all too much, I can't cope. You know, I've been shut for the last four months, now I've got to do this. How are they gonna be able to do it? Um, and it um, I think for, I don't wanna keep repeating myself, <laughs> but to, to think about it now, um, there is a really, again, another link that we'll, we'll, we'll send to you, but um, there is a really, um, excellent decision tree tool on the FSA website, um, which you go through, and you, you have to do this product by product. I would suggest mm -hmm. because of the different, you know, scenarios that you'll you'll find. Um, but going through that, you will very quickly be able to see what is affected and what isn't affected. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, now is the time for for businesses to get even more up close and personal with their products. With the things that they're producing with their suppliers um, and, and as Mark said you know making sure that you've got some basic things in place like recipes like you know product specs recipe specs um, and even like hints and tips like putting the actual brand of the food ingredient on the recipe so if it says to make the sandwich with Hellman's mayonnaise it says that on the recipe or it says breaks mayonnaise or whoever's it might be. So that's it's again, it's one of these sort of if a chef or if someone is making the sandwich and they look and say, oh, it says Hellman's mayonnaise, but hold on a minute, this is breaks mayonnaise. 
you know, then that should be flagging something up that something's not quite right. So things like that are really helpful um, in the back of house scenario where people are, you know, perhaps perhaps making things. And it will be a, it will be a cultural shift for a lot of businesses where perhaps they have allowed the sort of creativity or have allowed, um, you know, perhaps people when they're, for example, I keep saying sandwiches, but they are really good examples. Um, where people aren't necessarily weighing out, you know, 30 grams of cheese, you know, a tablespoon of mayonnaise and then and then a couple of lettuce leaves. Mm. People are going to have to get a bit more, you know, clever about how they make up these products because yeah. obviously the ingredients list is in descending order of magnitude. It has to be. Yeah, they have to get it in the right order. It's there. So yeah. um, it's coming up with, you know, things like scoops for grated cheese those sort of portion control types of um, things that you can put into place to make that easier for everybody. Almost working backwards. Yeah, you know. yeah. Put it easy is it to make a ham sandwich? Well, that's yeah. two slices and two slices of bread. Yeah. Uh, then you get obviously get more complex. So then, uh, I think, we, sorry, go on, Mark. Well, I was saying, don't th I think people shouldn't think of it as stifling creativity. I think people should think a bit of it as saving lives. And because you are. You, you are giving somebody the opportunity not to or to be able to eat something that they otherwise could have done inadvertently and it could have made them really, really unwell or worse. Mm -hmm. And I think just think of it in that in those terms. And I think that once you get used to writing a recipe, it's not actually very difficult. And um, why, if you make something delicious, would you not want to make that again the same way? doesn't mean you can't do another recipe which is a tweak on that first recipe it's no different it's just a different way of working um, and just on the, the you mentioned about the brands on Cafudo, it does give you a, um, a two lines one that you fill in which is just like mayonnaise and one line afterwards which actually you can put the brand uh, which is what we do um, which you could say Heinz Hellman's whatever it may be Stokes and you can make sure that that's what you actually do in your ordering so the labelling will just say mayonnaise, it doesn't say the brand, but it will just say uh, convert through to the quantitative um, list of ingredients at the end. Yeah, that makes sense. And so turning that question around then, we're talking about, oh, how hard it's going to be. Are there any commercial opportunities? I mean, I guess this lends itself to Mark, really, this question. I, I, think, I think the biggest commercial opportunity is trust trust for the consumer that they can be or they will be able to eat at a place for the perhaps they thought i'd never be able to go in there because it's just too too dodgy for me or and i think if you um really take it seriously and look at yourself as a specialist in in terms of the food you provide of managing your allergy allergies it is a better practice and there's, there's the commercial benefit is also around having recipes, uh, you know what you're buying, you know what you're selling, you know your stock. Um, and actually, actually it's, well, if you know what um, it costs to make 30 portions of something, uh, that information is far more readily available. And it does provide or will provide, I think, particularly contract caterers and other people with much more information about their business and what's being spent, what's being used. And some people won't like that, understandably, but actually from a business point of view, that's a massive commercial benefit um, because I know what pizza A or pizza B or pizza C cost to put together. And then if I haven't got that money at the end that I'm expecting, I'll be able to go back and look at mm, what happened there then uh, far more readily. And I'll be able to see because those were the ingredients used. Where did the rest go? I think it's yeah. a it's, there's lots of commercial benefits in that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, just a, quite a specific question for Audrey. Uh, someone's asked, we're not selling packaged food, but we're giving away samples. Um, do we need to label them? The samples are in packages. Um, yes, because they're if you're uh, providing them directly said earlier with the care yeah. um again it does it's this financial transaction doesn't need to have taken place you're still offering um the only other um area where you might not need to label it is if it is of a, a size a sufficient small size that fits then into the exemptions there are some exemptions okay. for packages so um it depends on how big it is really 
but the general mm. the, the you know the general rule is if you're offering it to someone you still have to label it as food packed and what about packages before the food that we've um we're doing before the October the first. I mean, we can we can do it now. We can start now, can't we? We can get yeah, ready. Yeah. As soon as we're ready, yeah, we can definitely. just start working in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I would I would hesitate to say label it now. I think you've got to get your ducks in the row, get everything sorted, and then you can do it. You don't have to wait until October the first. Um, so I think you know a lot of the we've still got five months. So an awful you know you can do a lot of research and and a lot of the the planning and the groundwork. Um, to be in, in the best place you can be come come October, and that has been said by people from the Food Standards Agency that you know they are expecting enforcement officers to um, to be very understanding in terms of the impact that this is going to have on businesses, um, and to try and sort of take a more advisory role rather than you know just um, prosecuting or, or putting improvement notices in place and things like that. They are um advising EHOs and local councils to yeah, be standing of, of this impact. Um, that, great, wouldn't it? that happens yeah. or not, but hopefully yeah, you know, that, we'll that will be that will be the, the the way they operate. That links on a little bit from our next question. Someone's asked that their their takeaway owners pride themselves on getting the five star rating that they can show in their window. Will there be an official rating for these new laws, do you know? Nothing specific, um, although, as I said, it is, it, it is tricky because this does fall between trading standards and food hygiene. Um, but certainly in terms of food hygiene, it, it will come into, you know, at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, it's misleading customers or not providing food, you know, of the substance and nature that's expected. So, you know, there are still certainly um, areas of, of under the Food stand, you know, the food safety that, that is implemented by this, um, and it would then, you know, there would be an element of the of the food hygiene rating that would cover that side of it in terms of certainly cross contamination and things like that. So, um, you know, it could be reflected in that, but it won't be a separate um, accreditation. That's something, as Mark was saying, that people like um, Celiac UK and things like that aren't they are, are developing yeah. those sorts of yeah. um, standards yeah. accreditations. But it's going to be on that checklist, isn't it, when they come around and do their thing? Um, and I've got a business selling homemade cakes. Do I need to label these? Um, again, if you're packaging them up, um, if you're packaging them up and somebody has ordered them, then you're packaging them at the customer's request. If you make, um, you know, I don't know, some brownies and you package them all up and then um, people come and get them from your house, say, um, and, and you've already packaged them up. And that package encloses the product and you can't change the product inside without opening the packaging. That, again, would be classed as pre-packed for direct sale and you'd have to label it. If somebody rang up and said, or ordered online, um, and you then delivered it to them, that comes under a different piece of legislation, which is all about distance selling. Um, and in that scenario, you don't have to label it. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing because you should have already provided the allergen information when that person chose the item that they were, they were ordering online. And also you provide either the information or a signpost to the information when you deliver it to them. So you're already covering your obligations under allergen legislation through that um, side of things, the distance selling. But if they are physically coming to you, to your door, and, and saying, oh, I have one of those brownies that you've packed up, packed up over there, they didn't order it initially, mm -hmm. yep. then you should be labelling it. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're taking And of course, if you are, if, you're, if you have, if they have ordered it, and they come to collect it, you're supposed to have that information readily available anyway. And yep. I think that's the interesting thing, a lot of the inf this information is already there. Yes. Um, you're, you're just having to wrap it in, a, in an ingredients list and putting it on a label. Yeah. Well. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. I think um, that's wrapped up all the questions that I wanted to ask you guys. Thank you so much. I'm just going to show a quick recap video and then we'll finish up.
Thank you. Well, Audrey and Mark, thank you so much for the last hour. It's, it's been great. Your input's been fantastic. I do appreciate it. Thank you. And I think the audience found it really very interesting, judging from all the questions and interest. Um, we will put some resources out from everyone. I think Audrey's mentioned quite a few resources. We do have a website specific to Natasha's Law, so we'll up, make sure if it's not on there already, it will be. And then we will signpost you where that is. We've got a recording of this video. And then there's blogs that we're doing every couple of weeks. So just keep in touch with our web and our LinkedIn um, and Audrey's and Mark's as well. Just follow them because they're posting information as well. And thank you all very much. Are we going to redo the poll? Oh, yeah. Sorry. The poll. <laughs> da, da, da. Where is that now? Okay. So we've got one more poll. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. That's better, isn't it? So 92% of you know what you need to do. Fantastic. We will we will do all the 7%. But no, that's <laughs> great. Just don't hope. Thank you, everyone. I do appreciate you listening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye.